um, the family is talking about selling cows and scaling back because they can't support them in, in some ways. So it's kind of a scary time, I think, for a that lot sounds, of folks in the Midwest. That really sounds extreme. Yeah. So yeah. The, that Western heat wave is, is also really affecting Minnesota. And, and the yeah. And yeah. The yeah. Dakotas. I, I, yeah, I, I thought it was mostly more west of that. But. Yeah, no, they've, they've, they've just had no rain, I think. And so like all the, everything that might be hay uh, is, is not there as usual, but we have the, it's been pretty warm here. I don't know. It looks like you've got a nice breeze coming through. <laughs> it's an electric breeze, right? Oh, is it? <laughs> my faithful little fan. <laughs> you know. nice. yeah, we don't keep AC up here in the cabin. We don't expect it to go on for days in the 90s. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, anyway, weather uh, we knew was not going to be an innocent topic in this in this century. <laughs> No. <laughs> Talking about the weather, that was you, wasn't it? <laughs> it was. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think that was decades ago. <laughs> Talk about the weather. Yeah. All right, let me turn okay. this Okay, I've got my coffee too. All right, everything is working now. Um, for those of you that are on Zoom, uh, you can use the, you know, interactive elements as you wish. Uh, those of you on other, like Facebook or Twitter or YouTube, you can leave comments and stuff there or questions there. Um, I'll be seeing them all, but Catherine and Jake don't have to uh, watch anything. And just so you all know, um, what you, you see, Jake, Catherine, is not what everyone else sees. I control that, so it'll rotate. But you don't have to worry about that. You can leave everyone up on the screen or whatnot. Um, if someone, it's the first day of summer here. If if I if I disappear because someone's banging on the door and it's not because I'm dead, it's because the 13 year old is probably like, "Can I play video games?" And that's very reassuring, Trip. Yeah, I just giving you a heads up because no one else will know I disappear. Or if you have to, just message me. I'll, you know, I just uh, who knows what happens in live streams. But um, <laughs> excellent. All right, now I'm going to hit record. Hello, everyone. This is Trip, and I am here with the one and only Catherine Keller and Jacob Erickson at the very same time. Why? Well, because this is a process party of the apocalyptic variety. And I said to myself, if we are going to have a process party and get apocalyptic at the same time, who do I want to do that with? Clearly, <laughs> these two. So I don't know if that's a compliment or like that you're just known for getting apocalyptic, the process variety, or maybe I just picked the topic just so I could hang out with you two because I'm lonely in a basement in Scotland and wanted to spend time with you. But there's a lot of reasons to be here uh, and I'm glad to do so. And I thought as we get things started, um, this is not on my list of topics I sent you, um, but this one won't, this is not a hard one, is for, uh, each of you to ask the other one a question um, that will get get the other to share maybe a story or a bit of info that the the average person who's interacted with you online reading books and stuff won't know because y'all uh, Jake worked with Catherine and now they've done a whole bunch of different writing and stuff together with book projects research all that kind of stuff so what's a question you wish the other answered uh for, for the interested people. And uh, I'll let Jake ask the question first because he just looks so eager. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That's such a hard one. That's like, hmm. Um, 
How far, how far, how far in depth of a conversation do we want to get to first? You want, do you want a sort of smaller question? Do you want a larger one? Oh, no, I, one, one where, one, where, where Catherine will share something either about herself or fun moment or like, you know, where she answers a get to know you question that only you could ask because you got to spend a lot of time with her and then she can ask you one and we're like, Oh, a little, little info bits about each of you to set the, uh, to set the table of excitement. Yeah. Well, maybe, okay, maybe this might be um, a different kind of uh, approach. I know, so Catherine, in my experience, always has a very um, unique and wonderful sense of visual art. Uh, and the, um, the artists that she often engages with, with like her books, um, her book covers and, and things like that. And so I'm, I'm maybe, maybe like when you, when you're writing um, and thinking about like what you want your books to look like or what kind of images you want to go with it, like what, what's your thought process and what drives, what draws you in with a really good piece of visual art? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jake, right. Uh, I mean, I, I think I should just lie down on my couch and, and let you psychoanalyze me. So, you know, both of my parents, uh, my blood father, Milton Cohen, whom I did not grow up with, and my mother, uh, Jane, uh, were artists. They got together as painters, and it was a traumatic relationship that ended in divorce when I was two. Um, <laughs> and the role of art in, in my life was always crucial. We were, you know, we, we were in a family situation where we couldn't keep jobs or anything. So we moved all over the country. Well, the world, excuse me, but always my mother got us to museums. <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, there's, uh, there's a uh, deep family history <laughs> that we're, we're not going to surface any more of today, but you know, like I, I didn't know the painter who did this piece um, for my book, uh, Wendy, Wendy, um, this is Rick Mullen actually, it was called Wendy Co for this new book. Uh, but I was delighted and I was given, given many options. Um, I, I suppose the, the, the two painters, you know, who were most important to me at formative stages were uh, Clay and Kandinsky. Mm -hmm. Also, you know, a little, little retrograde back there to that modern point, but, but I abs absolutely love the, the spiritual microcosms of, of Paul Clay, and I loved the, the, the force fields of, of raw colored energy of Kandinsky, and, and both of them, of course, were profoundly spiritual persons uh, very explicitly uh, theosophical with Kandinsky. Uh, more indirect and subtle with with clay uh, so <laughs> i'm going to stop there um yeah so it 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 it, it evolves yeah. sometimes i like to do a little sketching myself a little painting maybe i'll find more time for that if i retire sometime soon <laughs> Work it, work it into the into the books as as jane bennett has worked her doodles her into doodles. the book yeah, I see. I didn't know. I didn't know that about the Kandinsky connection because I've got a weird Kandinsky connection as well. Where the the one artist that I sort of was exposed to as a kid was a, a cowboy artist by the name of Walt Peel, who was who was influenced by Kandinsky, and he used to he used to paint these wild rodeo scenes <laughs> in the <laughs> Kandinsky like style, and his his um and the main and the main sort of progressive artsy bar in uh, back home was called the blue rider um and so that's wow. the that's where i sort of um hung out <laughs> with all the 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 north dakota the north dakota progressive kids oh, i love it the cowboy version of die blaue reiter <laughs> yeah, exactly yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah beautiful i'm glad to hear about this this uh cowboy side of you yeah there, there is that occasionally cowboy jake Cowboy Jake. Cowboy Jake. I have a pair of boots. I have a pair of hats. Yep. Well, all right, Catherine. What what question do you want to ask Jake? <laughs> Any? Yeah. 
Well, I'd like him. I, I'd like to. I'd like him to uh, give us a little hint uh, as to just where he is at this moment in in his uh, finishing up of a certain book. And I'd, I'd love for I'd love for us to just hear a, a little of his language of, about the the kind of uh, the kind of profound eco poetics is at work and maybe a hint of the way eco-poetics and eco-grief uh, actually um, flow in and out of each other in his in his poetics mm -hmm. in your poetics Jake <laughs> yeah thanks Oops. I'm always kind of uh, working and thinking through um, yeah so the so the the, the book is um, being finished up this summer um, oddly uh, you know, writing about eco grief, the theopoetics of planetary feeling is what the subtitle is of it. Um, uh, and, and oddly delayed by sort of uh, COVID on one hand and my grandmother's death on the other and, um, uh, and, and a number of, of, of griefs uh, of my own, but um, uh, coming along in really interesting ways. So uh, I, I guess it, it really came through it, uh, it, in my dissertation, one of my chapters was on tragic beauty and in the Anthropocene and the, and the different ways that we sort of have to think through beauty and, 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 and sort of stare into the wounds of the planet in, in some really difficult ways, given the fact that a lot of things have changed that we can't really um, quote unquote fix uh, and what fix would look like anyway, even as the urgency of the climate crisis demands us. And, um, and, and so I, I started reading a lot in that process on um, a lot of psychologists and a lot of um, psychoanalysts and a lot of folks who are working in this emergent concept of eco grief and climate grief and environmental despair and ecological affect uh, and all of the emotional ways that we encounter planetary life and really found that uh, it was through uh, Treby Johnson, um, Radical Joy for Hard Times that talked about, you know, when we stare into ruined places, it stares back and it, it, it disarranges us and our expectations of what it means to be in place. Mm. And that um, she's the language of disarrangement and, and what does it mean to, to be in that disarrangement in such a way to um, be invited to commit yourself to gazing in that place, to commit yourself to creating acts of what she called guerrilla beauty um, uh, in collaboration with a wounded place such that something new might emerge. And that's really, to me, it's sort of the emergent space of how I was experiencing grief for my um, fracked Western North Dakota homelands and, um, uh, what what might be created here uh, as a grieving process. And I think that that's for me is a really theological task, a theopoetic task, a poesis of, of making uh, in collaboration with a space. So I've, I've been writing this book on uh, various different kinds of understandings of grief, um, environmental uh, 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 despair, uh, ambiguous loss, um, uh, 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 sort of disenfranchised grief, grief that's not recognized as grief, but is clearly in our bones um, uh, in mineralic ways. And, and so I've been thinking about what does it mean to write theology as a practice of grief and as a practice of constructive grief such that we can poetically hold all of these disarrangements um, and also acknowledge that they're, they're not necessarily um, to be concluded or finished off uh, or resolved. Uh, and then it's a process of living in the wake of climate change, uh, lifelong process, vocation maybe even. That's kind of where I'm at. Um, what a grief that we get over. Well, everyone, aren't you, aren't you pleased that I happen to ask that question of that man? <laughs> mm. Yes. Thank you for such, such revelation of, of where, where this amazing work is taking us, Jake. Yeah. <laughs> so between um zoom and facebook and youtube and twitter there's just under 300 people currently on the stream 
and I got a whole bunch of different questions from people for that. I told y'all kind of organized, um, but you know, I'm, I'm hoping to uh, j- just chaperone the conversation between uh, two brilliant friends uh, enough that uh, those who sit questions feel like help shape the conversation, but y'all's genuine interest and care uh, and the way y'all think together uh, is uh, really the centerpiece. So feel free to interject and send each other down different trajectories whenever it makes sense. Um, and uh, otherwise, it, w- it would be anti-process for me to follow my outline with uh, fundamental, uh, fundamentalist zeal. Um, But one of the questions that came in that I think might be a real uh, fruitful way to start is both of you in different ways see the apocalypse upon apocalypses that are just like lining up today as something we need to address and haven't as constructive theologians um, and trying to do the theological task involves wrestling with all the apocalypses of the present in different ways than the church has handled the apocalypse in the past and in different uh, registers that our current economic cultural system has to wrestle with them. So maybe you could each share a bit about how you would frame our current moment as a, as, a, as a space for, uh, for theological reflection that's generative and hopefully an invitation to a, a life-giving uh, way of being. Want me to start this time? I think that's right to you. Uh, right, yeah. right. Let me hold up the book again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, my book is, is just out, so Facing Apocalypse with the subtitle Climate, Democracy, and Other Last Chances. Um, and your question is excellent, Trev, because it just it gets us in, in there to the question of, of, of how theologically uh, to meditate on our present situation uh, in terms of apocalypse, but vice versa also, how to meditate on the apocalypse, uh, the ancient one in terms of our present situation, uh, because we have to keep that a both way interchange since that, that book of Revelation has been so incredibly influential. Um, you know, so I, I wrote a book on the apocalypse in 1996 and I'm not a biblical scholar, but I was very worried at that point at how theologians, at least in the United States, were ignoring it unless they were right-wing or conservative, very conservative theologians. Uh, In Europe, at least Jürgen Moltmann was touching seriously on eschatology and the apocalypse. Um, And I was very worried about the way Ronald Reagan and and his Christian crew were using it uh, and how it could justify uh, a nuclear war (laughs) or other forms of planetary destruction. So I, I wrote that back then. Uh, but I was very, very ambivalent towards the book of Revelation and John of Patmos, who's profoundly uh, sexist or even misogynist uh, and bitter in, in ways that don't resemble the spirit of the gospels. Uh, and, and yet he's a, he's a profoundly insightful prophet. So I, I worked on that ambivalence in the 90s and I hoped I was done with it. Uh, and, and lo and behold, you know, get a ways into this millennium. And I, I felt again, uh, that call to come back to the book of Revelation uh, because, uh, because climate change especially is going to make sure that we constantly hear the term apocalypse. We're not going to escape it. Uh, we're not going to be able to just circumscribe it. Uh, and so whatever we think of the likelihood that we can, we, we can get through uh, the tremendously destructive forms of, of economic uh, social practices that are driving climate change, which is driving uh, mass extinctions, et cetera. Whatever we think about the likelihood that we can get through it, uh, you know, however optimistic or pessimistic we are, uh, something else is at stake. The apocalypse is just going to be around. It's going to be in our faces. There is going to be used in secular ways all the time. Like I think what really hit me was, was the entomological say the insect study called the insect Armageddon on, on the precipitous drop uh, of insect life, you know, down below one third now uh, in Germany. 
And then the next year, uh, which is, I think it came out three years ago, <laughs> the insect, <laughs> the insect apocalypse, the Guardian called uh, the study of the two Americas. Uh, and, and again, the, the work was being used in a totally secular way and appropriately. These weren't scientists saying it's all over folks, give up. They're saying, listen, wake up, <laughs> open your eyes. So it seemed to me uh, that again, as a theologian, uh, it was important for me to, to help folk, uh, Christian folk, and maybe some others too, uh, to uh, get better hold of the language of apocalypse. I'm gonna to try to get a little more succinct here because <laughs> I'm obviously too immersed in this. But mm -hmm. so what I, what I felt was we, we actually need to, to, to live into the root meaning of apocalypse and help other people to realize what it is and to say it over and over, ad nauseum, say it. Apocalypsis in the biblical Greek does not mean the end of the world. It doesn't mean destruction. It doesn't mean annihilation. Apocalypsis means <laughs> eye-opening. It means disclosure. It means literally unveiling. And far from gloomy, this is why the party metaphor works for me. Actually, the most common ancient use of the term apocalypsis was for the unveiling of the bride on her wedding night. You know, so it's, it's the sexiest moment of the ancient known world. And that's the unveiling. <laughs> And that's, that's, that's playing between the lines in John's apocalypse, which ends, which ends with what? A wedding party, the new Jerusalem and, <laughs> and the lamb. It's a great wedding party. So it seemed to me that we need to get out that apocalypsis means disclosure, not closure. In fact, that there is in the Bible, no the end of the world. There is in the Bible through centuries of prophetic writing, experience of and warning of horrific levels of destruction, of mass human and non-human destruction. And John's in that tradition and was foreseeing rather accurately, wouldn't you say, that there would be huge levels of, of mass destruction. Uh, humanly, terrestrially, before things could perhaps undergo the radical transformation that was hoped for. Uh, so it, it, it just it feels crucial to me to use the word and use it right. Now, it doesn't mean just party, obviously. <laughs> An apocalypse party is a rather dark kind of party, but it's a party, it's a party that's got a brilliant darkness to use that, that ancient mystical metaphor, a glowing darkness, because if we the point is if we can if we can face the horrific patterning. Uh, of our world in terms of imperial top-down power and imperial global economics code, uh, <laughs> the whore of Babylon with her 29 luxury products. So, uh, so it's glo the beast of, of global imperial power and the great corn queen of global economics 2000 years ago. Uh, understood to be already bringing about uh, terrible destruction. But to say it's not that John of Potmos was predicting what was going to happen in, you know, 2030. Uh, prophecy is not prediction. That's not what prophecy means. Prophecy is what I call dream, <laughs> a dream reading. Prophecy is a deep reading of patterns in our world, patterns that are so entrenched that they are going to have terrible long-term impact. And the prophets are warning, warning about those entrenched structural patterns 
of, of oppression uh, and greed uh, and unfaithfulness uh, altogether. They're warning uh, and they're expecting that the warnings won't be heard easily, uh, that greater destruction would come first. And there's been unbelievable, unimaginable destruction already through the history that followed the book of Revelation, in, indeed uh, through Christian history. And there might, be, uh, there might be yet quite a bit more, but the point isn't that, that the book of Revelation is predicting the factual uh, outcome of human history. It's dream reading deep patterns that would go on and on and on and were felt to be relevant century after century after century and are still relevant now and are calling us to <laughs> this eye opening, this disclosure um, and calling us not just to be afraid, <laughs> uh, but to take heart. <laughs> that wedding party is really possible. It's really possible because we open our eyes, uh, because we unveil uh, the, the truth of our, of our situation. And it's a truth with very dire parameters, but it's a, a truth that is, is not lacking in hope. <laughs> perhaps not optimism, uh, but again, yeah, a dark hope. So I, I, I want to, I think, pause there. Uh, so that's what I, I did. I got into the book of Revelation in, a, in an actually very, very close reading. Again, because the metaphors of the unfolding clouds, the morning bird, <laughs> Mourning in the in Jake's sense of of grieving, <laughs> of the pangs of, of the earth when they give birth, of the porn queen, of the weaponized word, but finally of that down down to earth, New Jerusalem, that cosmopolitan um, hope. All 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 of these metaphors seem like metaphors that uh, we we want to confront now uh, and not not to feed our our dangerous pessimisms and our perhaps even more dangerous optimisms, uh, but, our, but our shared capacity for, for transformation. So, so Jake, what do you think We're, when you're thinking of processing the apocalyptic moment? Because Catherine kind of just wove together the book of Revelation and different strands of her own thought while also discussing a dark apocalyptic party that we're invited to and giving a feminist reading of the horror of Babylon that, you know, turns it against neoliberal capitalism and it's a, you know, movement of extraction. I, 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 I know I'm just interested in what you're doing next after that. I mean, well, I'd say that gives me hope oh, yeah. <laughs> in a different kind of way. Uh, I'm loving all of the, I'm seeing the comments about the, the gender apocalypse reveal party is happening in the, in the chat, uh, which I'm, I'm absolutely loving because of course that's a, it's a talk about gender queer reversals, right? The gender reveal parties are precisely to, <laughs> to pin down with the sort of clarity versus we might want to do something different. Um, in a in a queer kind of way, but I mean the 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 it's it's you know I think I think maybe that um, my 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 interest in Revelation has been very uh, very interesting because um, so coming out of a Lutheran tradition, you know Luther is famously sort of really skeptical about Revelation that it's a question does it like James does it does it actually preach Christ in his Christocentric imaginary so should we even you know as a Lutheran kid I was always told be careful when you get there <laughs> that's that might be that might be a place that you don't necessarily want to go and yet at the same time while I was graduating high school of course or getting through um it was the height of the left behind series and all of the uh these <laughs> millenarian sort of modes and I became really fascinated about why people were interested in this and so um in high school ended up um, uh, with the local pastor reading, uh, reading Revelation together and reading historical criticism when I was like 17, trying to figure out what the heck was going on here, what the, 
you know, varieties of things were going on. Um, and then, uh, and then when I was in college, sneaked into one of Craig Kester, Revelation and the End of All Things book, one of Craig Kester's classes. And, you know, his, his, his whole thing at the time was to say that, you know, you know, what does it mean to, oh yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, Craig's book. <laughs> it's, it's a pretty, it's a, it's a beast itself, you know, like, <laughs> The, 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 but he, he did this beautiful thing where he said, okay, what does it mean to read this in its actual context as a letter to actual historical people and, and did the political and, and, and read of it. But then he also wove in all of the, all of the hymns and all of the music and all of the, the sort of artistic flourishes, the Durr pieces and of art. And, and you get a sense in which like the, the, the way that this particular apocalypse genre um, is so vibrantly interdisciplinary. It's like its own little liberal arts education <laughs> in a tiny letter. And I think that's, I think that's what, really, uh, what really struck me is that, that, that uh, rather than, um, of course I didn't have Catherine's language at the time to really articulate um, uh, those kinds of, of moves, but, but there was this sense in which that these, these recurring patterns of intensity and intense violence and release and singing um, over and over again were mimicking uh, a kind of artistic resistance to something. And that was really compelling. And that artistic resistance was over and over and over again with a kind of ecological imagination where, where Christ is this you know, lamb beast thing. Um, uh, and, and it really, I think, oddly going through the book in that way opened up the prophetic tradition to me um, differently to see the ecological themes of um, in Paul creation growing in labor pains until now, the uh, trees of the field clapping their hand, the, the crying of, 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 of Cain's blood from the, the soil that, that really the prophetic um, movements and thematics uh, in, in biblical texts are are, are, are earthly uh, in a really profound way. And not perfect, of course, they're always entangled with <laughs> historical uh, uh, modes of misogyny and, uh, and odd forms of power. Um, but but there's, there's a sense in which, as Holmes Rolston said, that you know, the, the, the ancient uh, folks who wrote the Bible um, uh, in all of their contexts knew their ecologies at a native range. And, and that's how they spoke and sung. Uh, throughout how they understood uh, uh, oppression and um, liberation and hope. And so that just, I think, I think it forced me to step back in the midst of, uh, in the midst of my, you know, my second, I was, my last year of high school graduation was, was 2001. And so I was in the wake of the sort of emergence of this militaristic um, uh, uh, response to 9-11 to and, and the apocalyptic overtones of that. And so, uh, and now I find myself in the ecological frame again, uh, uh, trying to figure out what does it mean to, to, to talk to talk about the climate crisis without a sense of doomism to it or a, a sort of a doomer litany. I, I, I just can't. I, I, there's something about the 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 re recitation of the losses that feels so much like a trapped trauma response to me um, mm -hmm. that we haven't really fully been able to articulate. So. Um, it's all that. I mean, I, I, uh, I, you know, I go back and forth on Revelation in a lot of ways. Like, is is the heavenly city at the end? Just as I think it's Stephen Moore's metaphor that it's sort of like a, a mall with a nice tree and a flowing stream in the middle of it, without much ecological life to it. Or is it actually a dedication to the sort of um, the divine solidarity with with the earth? Uh, and, and I think it's both, right? But um, uh, it's it's uh, we're not going to lose it. Uh, not going to lose the apocalyptic language anytime soon. Mm -hmm. So we need to use it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it there. You know, it, in both of your answers, you brought up a couple things people had mentioned before around just how you both think about the tradition, poetics, uh, apophatics, and like what? How do you look at sources uh, when thinking theologically around? Um, topics that are addressing the whole, you know, our, our relationship to nature, our relationship to the tradition, like Jake echoes his own, uh, like geographical location where he grew up, but also his Lutheran 
um, tradition. Catherine's mentioned her the way her family of origin and then relationship to particular art. Like also both talked about theopoetics before and apophatics. Like uh, in John Tatominal had a specific question, but there are a number around. Both of you are very creative at how you relate to sources, traditions, communities of theory, and then are yet you're like open but distinctively grounded in your tradition and yet open. And so there are questions around it, but I'll, I'll read John to Tomino's question because uh, it's here. And, um, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to not ask John to Tomino's question when he typed it out here. And uh, um, I wish I could just make him pop up and ask it, but uh, both Jake and Catherine weave a apophatic theological strands into their process theologies. We should not be surprised that the student follows in the dark wake of his teacher. Oh. Um, but I am curious to know why both believe that synthesis be necessary. What becomes a process when it is infused with the apocalyptic? Why does process need the apophatic? Does the apophatic also need process? Do we bo need both to cope with our current apocalyptic mo uh, moment? <laughs> um, like in that, and I, in the, I had very similar questions about uh, how do you operate in a tradition, but you're pushing its edges? How do you move past logocentrism and theology and move to poetics? Like both of you have that kind, that kind of delicate dance. Do you have a specific response to John's, but also just uh, uh, advice on how to think uh, theologically in generative ways? Oh, <laughs> John Titano, hello there. I'm very honored that you've showed up uh, and and grateful for a question that might allow uh, allow me to think a little bit about the apophatic apocalyptic relation, which is a very odd one, and how the apophatic and the apocalyptic are together related to process thought. <laughs> and but but yeah, in terms of just how how to how to approach uh, how to approach theological questions, how to approach uh, the key the key religious texts uh, and themes of our lives. I think I think you want to first of all uh, approach with with honesty. You know, no uh, holy BS. Uh, you know, God isn't interested <laughs> in in you know like pious pretense whatever we're calling god uh <laughs> is is i would think only going to be only going to be uh faithfully tuned to if if your theological questions are profoundly honest uh that means surfacing your doubts your worst doubts about whether even he exists yeah, the doubts, uh, your fears about, you know, what if your queerness comes out, uh, you're in an evangelical congregation and your, your doubts, your fears have, have to be in there in your honesty, but also uh, your, your, deepest, your deepest sense of attraction. You know, what's really calling you or in the process sense, luring you you all know, I think, who tune in here, <laughs> that the, the the most the most rigorous and pre precise expression of the divine will in Whitehead is the lure, <laughs> the divine lure. Uh, so, which invites, which beckons, and and yes, it has a, a delicately erotic edge to it. Of course, lure does, um, and you need to you need to hear and, and feel what is really what is really luring you. And if you're grounded in that honesty and you, you find at least someone you can be fully honest with even verbally, you will, you will get the, the skills and the strategies you need then to translate in and out of very different contexts, uh, in and out of, of sometimes quite conservative contexts. That's a particular hermeneutical skill uh, and I think a lot of you already uh, uh, are much better at it uh, than I am. I'm kind of good at helping students to develop that skill, but I don't know that I have it myself because I didn't grow up in a, a, 
a steadily Christian environment, let alone an evangelical one. So I came at it all from a very different angle uh, as the modern art background does suggest. Um, so it's wherever you're coming from, uh, having, a, having a, a, a prayerful space of really rugged honesty about hope, fear, and desire, that seems hermeneutically crucial to me. And then, then you can do all kinds of, of hermeneutical uh, uh, translations into context. You can do it playfully, you can do it very carefully, uh, you can do it provocatively, uh, you can do it uh, <laughs> Uh, as, as, a, as a social activist uh, exercising strong leadership, you can do it as a pastoral counselor, you can do it as a teacher, or you can do it as a parent. Uh, but those, those, those endless translations that were pushed into uh, in our theological interpretations need, need to find, find roots roots, the word being radix for root, <laughs> uh, radical rootedness uh, in, in, your most, in your most vibrant, uh, honest perspective. Um, I don't know if that helps as a start, but I, I, I do want to address the apophatic and apocalyptic. If I could briefly, I could try briefly um, <laughs> in relation to process thought. Well, the, my work on the apocalypse in this way kind of is in a mirror play with my book uh, on, on the creation, face of the deep. In, in the face of the deep, I use process thought, other schematisms as well, but perhaps especially process thought to deconstruct uh, the false reading of the Bible as having a, a creation from absolutely nothing. So a kind of, a kind of, uh, of, of, of simple absolute uh, beginning of the world uh, out of nothing at all. Uh, it's not biblical, it has strong theological support uh, and has to be treated with care and respect in most contexts, but it's very important to, to understand that it's actually meaningful, that it's not biblical. And Whitehead thought it was biblical, but he went a different way anyway. Uh, he was wrong about the Bible and its creatio ex nihilo. So Whitehead on the creation, we, and that's, that's who then for theology opens up a very systematic understanding of a kind of, 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 of uh, bottomless uh, creativity of who knows how many worlds. Now, our universe certainly has a beginning and it will have an end uh, no, no time soon gives us no excuse to do what we're doing on the earth. So, and then it, with the apocalypse, I'm, I'm doing kind of the, the, the mirror opposite. I'm, I'm deconstructing the notion of an absolute end. And again, I'm saying on this, I'm being rather biblical. I don't claim to be a biblical literalist, but I, I, I think I'm, I'm biblically rather faithful in my understanding of the alpha and the omega. And I'm faithful to process thought in this. Uh, because there's no absolute beginning and no absolute end of the creativity of, of, <laughs> of the divine uh, in endless relationship, endless and beginningless relationship uh, to world, <laughs> however, however many worlds, however infinite a multiverse that world uh, might be. And at the same time, maybe more than a lot of process theologians, I know that we don't really know uh, so very much about uh, who God and God's self is, um, whether, the, whether our language even G-O-D and all and all uh, fits very well. Uh, so I'm part of an ancient Christian tradition of negative theology of, of always suspending any certainty about Christian dogmas. And because, because of being freed from certainty, one is uh, able to be uh, honest <laughs> and creative. Uh, and so it's not that apophasis shuts you up. Uh, and the, uh, no, it, I think it lets you communicate more fully and more creatively. And the apophatic in relation to, to the ap apocalyptic is crucial. The apophatic has to keep insisting, no, we don't know uh, what the end will be 
the Bible doesn't either. It doesn't talk about the end in any, in any final sense at all, uh, that there is a profound apophosis about where the universe or the multiverse or the creation is, is heading. Uh, but more importantly, much more importantly, we don't know where we as a, as a species are heading. And John of Patmos was very tuned to that uh, profound uh, uncertainty and so lifted up a creative vision of a, of a hopeful transformation, but one that's come by very, very rigorously. Uh, so one has to stay apophatic with one's apocalypse or else, or else, you know, one's just doing one more fundamentalist reading of the book of Revelation. And so I think all of this is, is, is a form of process theology, but, uh, but that will come out in the process of our conversation. I'll, I'll pause there, <laughs> thank you. After the deconstruction of, 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 of beginnings, I'm, I'm trying to figure out which beginning I should begin with. Um, uh, uh, the, the, I mean, there is this, there's a sense, I think, um, Catherine, about the apocalyptic language that, I mean, uh, you know, I, sort of progressive Lutheran-y context for me was that Luther's engagement with the apophatic um, was also an engagement with the apocalyptic in some ways that Luther's hidden God, there, there, there's certain things that you don't look into yeah. <laughs> God because you're going to sort of go mad, so to speak, in the, uh, in the apocalyptic speculation of what might happen to souls or ends or things like that. And yet he has this sort of, there's this, um, there's certain readings of Luther that are very much placing it with him within a sort of apocalyptic imagination, Heiko Obermann's biography, for instance, and, um, and ways in which his own sort of uh, Vitor Vestal calls it the, the bur burlesque language of the way that he talked about creaturely uh, relations and sort of seeing apocalyptic scenarios in very real time for him was always certain. So I think like for me, when I in engaging some of the apocalyptic language, it was there was also a kind of sense in which I was engaging with the apophatic or the unspoken in a different kind of way. Um, and then uh, and then uh, after reading Luther, someone handed me Pseudo Dionysius. <laughs> and, um, and you get to see the sense in which Dionysius um, or the Pseudo uh, uh, does the apophatic play as a sort of invitation to to transgress that kind of language? If there's, there's so much you can't say, therefore say everything as you possibly can. God is a drunkard. God is rock. Mm -hmm. God is right, um, and that sort of creative engagement with the apophatic, um, and that's that's kind of where it interests me is that, that sort of, sort of that creativity of language, which I so often recognize in 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 nature writers. Mm -hmm. um, everybody from what Annie Dillard to um, uh, to, to a number of folks uh, and 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 the ways in which there's sort of the the ability and the desire to describe um, context with a kind of humility, I guess, um, uh, with a kind of ecological humility, uh, means that one can do as much play of language uh, as possible, and then also acknowledge that you can't fully sort of grasp another creaturely thing with the very language that you're using, which has so been a dangerous um, inheritance of, of certain forms of Christian theology where the desire to name the other creatures is also a desire to uh, uh, ensnare them, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, uh, to describe them fully. And maybe that's, the, that's, that's where the apathetic John um, comes to be really important for me that, that on one hand, um, one could could simply say that um, we can't we can't really fully articulate anything, which is kind of a nihilistic position. Um, can't describe uh, our ecological context. Can't describe right. in analogical ways relationships to the divine in ways that might lead us to cherish them or to desire them more fully. Um, and then on the other hand, one might say that you could describe them fully, and that's a, a good taxonomy, and that might lead you to sort of um, taxidermy, the context that, that are around. And so I think the apophatic uh, offers this sort of play, yep. um, uh, not just for the divine, but for, for our inter-creaturely relations that allow us to sort of 
um, have a kind of back and forth <laughs> where we are always sort of playing with the edges of our, our relations with one another. Um, and that makes it more exciting to me because it means that there's not, there's not a taxidermied way of using language, but in fact, it is a living back and forth of, of creaturely interaction. That means that sometimes creatures resist us and our language. And sometimes uh, the ways we talk about creaturely love sort of un just, just unpacks uh, our, our sense of what it actually is. Um, the object escapes us in a desiring way. Um, so kind of where my mind goes with that. And your sense of playfulness is, of course, never far from your sense of grief. And, and that's, that's very important. This isn't a, 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 a reckless or a silly kind of, of play. Uh, it, it might make light of oneself sometimes yeah. <laughs> and of one's uncertainties and those of, of those with whom one is communicating. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a play of, of profound seriousness at the same time, which, which, which is why it stays, stays in touch with that with that mystery. But I, you know, and I want to um, just say one more thing about the epiphatic because of where you were taking it, Jake, mm -hmm. and, and, and precisely in relation to um, ecology. Um, <laughs> it's, it's of great importance that we name a whole lot of facts and, and, and you know, some of them with a high degree of, of likelihood, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, like, like I, I'm thinking about the life of the sea because in the book of Revelation, that was one of, one of the signals that really, you know, like got to me uh, chapter eight, nine, you know, where you have, uh, you have the, 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 the opening of the seventh, the seventh seal and, and, and what is that? There's the burning of, of a third of the trees of the earth and a dying of a third of the life of the seas. That, hit me hard a few years ago uh, because that was just about where we were by most estimates with the burning of the life of, uh, I mean, the, the dying of the, the life of the seas. So, you know, and I, I just recently encountered the facts from, a, from two recent UN study, right? The one UN study, the most recent says that 50% that of the life of the sea will be dead by the end of the century. There's another UN study that seems at odds with it that says that 49%, it's awfully close to 50, 49% of the life of the sea has died <laughs> since 2000, since the year 2000. So a little apophasis is needed here too, right? I, I mean, these are kind of contradictory uh, sci scientific projections of numbers, uh, but that doesn't, that doesn't erase them they're saying something very dire, even though uh, clearly they can't both be exactly precisely true. Because if we've already done 49%, we're going to get to a, a whole lot worse than 50% by the end of this century, right? You get that. <laughs> and they're both United Nations studies. So one, one needs a, 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 certain, a certain wise attention to uncertainty, even when dealing with scientific facts, not in order to discount the facts, <laughs> but in order uh, to work more well scientifically with them, in fact, to work responsibly with them. So it, it, it and, and then it becomes much more complex as you were going at with theology in terms of how we work with what, what we might think of as certain because it's given in, in faith, even though uh, with Luther, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera, faith never translates into certainty certainty would be uh, would be an idolatrous reduction of, of faith to knowledge. Um, but we need we need to, to work always at that edge and, and and as you're saying, yeah, work at that edge, but play at that edge <laughs> as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah the play, I mean the play is, is such an interesting thing because because I think you know so many folks think the the the, the playfulness is a kind of uh, either anything goes or it doesn't have any uh, local guts to it. But um, any sort of, any psychologist will tell you that play, play is precisely the learning at the edge of uncertainty <laughs> for, for adolescents and for kids as they try to figure out social conventions or create relations with one another. And, and it's, it just seems so important to me that, that the grief work is precisely sometimes 
um, needs a bit, sometimes you need to laugh at a funeral. <laughs> I mean, and it's not, it's yeah. not about giving up, but it's precisely about how one honors memory in a different kind of way or how one relearns one's relationship to what's mm -hmm. been lost in, in, in any, in any sort of, um, uh, sort of context. Um, and, and well, in that faith piece that you mentioned too, I mean, that's, this is for John Tamnell, that's a Tillich moment, right? That faith is not, doubt is not the opposite of faith. It's, it's a, a dynamic of it in a different kind of way. So that's, that's an apophatic move too. And uh, it, it requires a bit of possibility for how we, we local. The one thing I might add is, is that um, the, it seems to be more and more important um, in talking about the climate crisis um, this question of planetary scale. And that's where the apophatic becomes really important to me because it seems that in a lot of the environmental movements in trying to communicate scientific fact and scientific urgency on a planetary scale, sometimes those planetary facts um, wipe out more local injustices or manifestations of it. Um, and so the, the interplay of how folks locally describe their experience in ways that might mysteriously not be seen on a planetary scale and vice versa. Um, you know, that, that, you know, what does it mean to experience uh, a, a one degree warming and X location at any given time? One might not actually feel that, oh yes, clearly that's changed on a planetary scale in my one location. Um, so, so there's a weird planetary, um, uh, uh, apophatic move when, as one's thinking of, of, of locales and scale um, yeah. in time yeah. too, but physically, geophysically. Yeah. Oh, that's so crucial to, 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 and to keep, to, to keep that, that play, <laughs> that work at, at, mm -hmm. at, at that, at that tense edge between the, the local and the, the global alive, uh, vibrating you know, to keep what is most intimately locally embodied in our communities, in our bodies, actually, <laughs> very, very vivid and within its its own range of of, of forces, of energies, and of, of sufferings, of oppressions uh, that, that we need to work at. Uh, so that that locality is is like crucially where our energies are embodied and how they then can come forth into something with with global impact since it turns out that every little bit, especially if you're white heady and you know every little electron is actually <laughs> related to all the other electrons uh, on the globe uh, and and beyond. Uh, so we don't like escape it. I was just part of an interesting uh, discussion group. I was glad to uh, be part of it because they were almost all political uh, scientists and political philosophers responding to an essay by, by Richard Falk. Um, and his essay was, can human solidarity globalize? So we were all writing these one page things that were going out day on, every day of June on can human solidarity uh, globalize? And it was, it was really satisfying to be in an, a very international conversation <laughs> about, uh, about the, the, the deep challenge because of, of course we're always having to resist what, you know, what Falk was calling the, the tribalisms that disconnect us from uh, the, the, the global force of the neoliberal economy and its, and its uh, devastating impact, uh, the, the, the global reality of our ecological uh, interdependence. So it's very, uh, very important to push against that so-called uh, tribalism, but I push back against calling it tribalism because I think actually uh, the original tribes around the world, <laughs> still very alive in parts of Africa and Latin America and even the United States and Canada. Those, those tribal wisdoms uh, know all about the, the intri intricate microcosmic connection of, of every creature uh, to all the others in its world. Uh, it's, it's Western global civilization that actually broke us into separate individuals. So it's not, a, it, not for me about going anti-tribal, but find, finding a way to break, to break, to break free of the, of, of the ways, of, of the ways <laughs> in which we get 
we get artificially and oppressively separated uh, from the world of which we are absolutely a part, uh, vulnerable to and responsible for. And, and there, are, there is movement towards a more planetary consciousness. Uh, and, you know, one can hope that the worse things get with, <laughs> with climate change and through the suffering of COVID, one can hope that the, the awareness of the sensitivity, the dangerousness, the precarity of our globality mm -hmm. can call some critical mass of us to more active responsibility. <laughs> yeah, that that's really that's really helpful. I I feel like there's like a graduate school class uh, um, syllabus outline after you to answer a single question. That um, I don't know if y'all have taken up that consulting option for people working on syllabi, but um, y'all should consider it. <laughs> Uh, we, when, I don't think it'll pay. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> you can, if you decide not to to work on art in your retirement, you can uh, do that. Um, <laughs> you, you, one of the things uh, I'd be interested in how y'all see this. I'm I'm probably on the uh, uh, the uh, I don't know more definite side of process. You know, like the ones that like being a lot more clear than a lot of my apophatic friends are. But I when I when I saw the question. Um, there's a number, there's like two things in ap the apophatic reflection and in how the apocalypse functions that have strong resonance with um, process thought. And one is apocalyptic thinking, apophatic thought, and process thought uh, involve a negation of finality. Like whatever is inherited in the moment um, involves a kind of negation of finality, be it the positive attestations or the received superstructure that dominates the world, right? Or the past and pure repetition. All of them have this way in which the creative moment, right? Be it living in response to the lure of God or doing constructive theological reflection or thinking about global politics or whatever it is, involves that negative movement. And the other is that process apophatic and apocalyptic thinking in the biblical sense um the negation is not to make space for oneself but to make space for the possible mm -hmm. right and so it the negation of your language definite language about god is on behalf of the god unspoken and not because god can't be spoken but because god won't be Right in, the, in some uh, in some sense, and that the apocalyptic you're making space for what? Behold, I make all things new, or a new heaven and a new earth. But it's a new heaven and a new earth that hasn't forsaken the old one. And then how is that even possible under the 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 imperial grasp of our imagination, the cultivation of our desires online? Like there are all these ways, and yet what do we make space for? Right, it's like the coming of the new, and that that coming of the new is so connected to the, the, the eros of the divine and its relationship with the possible. And, and so I, I feel like you, if you were going, at least for me, if you're thinking about ways process apophatic and apocalyptic connect, especially from a process one, it has that moment of negating finalities and making space for something more than any one theologian, one tradition, one community, one wisdom uh, can possess. I just want to say briefly, yes, amen. Uh, negation of finality, not of finitude. Yeah, yeah. That needs to get blasted out there. It's a negation of finality in the sense of fin, F-I-N, finished. Um, not finitude. There's endless, endless loss and death, mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of it unnecessary, uh, hence the grief work, uh, but hence also the attunement to the possible. So you're right. There's a kind of double negation in the negation of any of any absolute uh, finality that then opens it up. It dis discloses the possible. <laughs> I, I, you know, I've been thinking recently about how mis misinterpreted uh, the gospel on, on, on the possible with God, all things are possible gets, you know, it's so often taken to mean God can do anything. Uh, <laughs> um, and 
and that's not the point. The mm. point that is, it, it, it's not that God's going to do it either. It's with God. Uh, and, you know, with God, uh, we are able to actualize something uh, that is possible that might not have been possible before. Uh, it doesn't mean we can do anything. It doesn't mean that God can do anything because God's power doesn't work that way. <laughs> uh, it's not, not top down in the imposition of actualities. It's, it's the lure of the possible. And mm -hmm. therefore, the, the really possible novum, right? Possible, not, not therefore probable. <laughs> uh, not guaranteed, but but the poss but the possibility is is uh, enlivening. What do you think, Jake? <laughs> yeah, Jake. What do you think? <laughs> I mean, also, amen. Uh, or this, or all of the chorus after the. I mean, um, it it makes me think of the in practice of the distinction between theopoetics and theopoetry a little bit. I mean that we, in an odd way, that we, we tend to imagine theological language or our um, response to divine lore oftentimes as in a, in a, in a crass, neoliberal technological way as in we are making something that we can do something with for the consumption of or for the, for the response of versus, you know, if, if, uh, if this if this God word is poet of the world, um, that that the embodiment of language and the embodiment of our bodies in coalitional forces and relational forces is the theopoiesis <laughs> um, uh, in in different kinds of ways that make um, that make newness uh, or or that embody newness um, rather than try to sort of. Uh, enact newness and then that also lures forth new newness um in it so the I, I just think i think it's a it's a shifty i've been reading a lot of eastern orthodox theology lately not necessarily because i'm um seduced by the overarching um, mood but because of the language of of that theopoiesis and transfiguration in the ways that it really is a more holistic sense of body <laughs> Um, and, and a holistic sense of that new creation um, it, that, that precisely doesn't necessarily um, negate finitude, um, but intimates um, creation into something uh, a, a divine um, or does, does a kind of divinity. Though, of course, Orthodox theology wouldn't, you know, necessarily even get that radical on that edge. But, but I do think about it quite a bit. Um, in that language of new creation. I, I think it's, it's interesting because it's an embodied thing. It's also a prophetic call itself. It's also um, a call to do, and it's, it's a call to embody language differently. Mm -hmm. so, so there are a couple questions I think that connect to where we've just been. Um, and and then there were a number around the connections between process thought and queer theology or queer thinking, right? Like, and what is, what would it mean to, for, to, to queer theology uh, from a process lens, right? And, um, and then another person texted and said, I just found out about process thought after I ditched growing up fundamentalist. Um, I came out queer. I got ditched by my family and church. And when I typed in queer theology, a lot of process people came up. I don't really know where I'm going with this. That's the gist of the email. So I thought maybe um, there's some that are much more comfortable and already get what's going on if you say I'm queering something or queer thinking. But could you give an introduction to the connections of process and queer thinking and then how, what that looks like, you know, in a more in-depth way for thinking through your own work? Because I, I, I don't want to leave out someone who is showing up on a live stream and going, I came out, I typed in queer and theology and people on this live stream showed up. So um, again, give the intro part and then what is that like in the academy when the queer theory process thought inter interact to you know, discuss divine becomings? You wanna start, Jake? Yeah, yeah. Um... Well, maybe maybe there are three there are three things that that I could say with with which um, 
link queer theory and, and process thought for me, um, it, importantly. Um, and one is, one is the, the, the becoming piece of materiality, uh, right? That, that early on queer theory was all about um, sort of iterations of gender performance in a lot of ways uh, and, and um, the cultural construction of gender. Um, and, and it always seemed to me that uh, in process thought, what you had was a sense of, 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 of creativity um, that allowed for that kind of space, that, that, that the materiality of bodies and the um, cultural becomings of, 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 of bodies and people um, uh, precisely was indeterminate and, and really could fundamentally become, <laughs> could change, could uh, transform, could perform itself differently from moment to moment to moment, iterative becoming sort of things move with difference even as they cite what's come before them. Um, and that's kind of a common, uh, a common piece for me, that, that, that indeterminacy of, of matter um, that moves to get there uh, naturally, but, um, but that's, that's one of them. A second one is, the, is fundamentally a, an imagination of, of the divine as eros, as desire, as lore, that um, rejects a certain kind of uh, heteropatriarchal uh, 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 <laughs> this reading of, of, of God in the sky uh, with, with a kind of uh, gender binary um, uh, that gets sort of proliferated in, uh, in churches and in Christian theology. Uh, and so process thought offered a different way of encountering um, or seeing or imagining divine empowerment or divine seduction in ways that was erotic, uh, that was different than um, coercive power, that was different than a sort of hyper-masculinist divinity that wasn't necessarily making space for um, uh, the other images of, of, of the divine that were incarnated in um, planetary life. Um, and the third, I think, is, is a kind of, importantly for me, a very, an open, that open reading of the future that I think oftentimes um, uh, the uh, uh, there's a lot of new things about queer temporality, where the future is read with a very kind of heterosexist imaginary that sort of we will save the planet for our children and our children's children, and that child just happens to look iteratively into the future like a a, a lovely uh, sort of uh, heterosexual family with two kids and, and uh, upholding a safe social structure into the future indeterminately. And, um, uh, and, and I, think, I think one of the things of process uh, with its emphasis on novelty and newness means that um, there are other ways of imagining uh, intergenerational realities um, that, that might um, offer, offer new space for, um, you know, uh, even given the social uh, power constructed ways that one imagines family um, or self, that we might emerge new ones um, in different kinds of ways. So those those are the three things that always come back to me. That's the the maybe it's the play of it, you know, the the uh, the kind of um, play lured by a bit of desire in every single direction. Oh. Oh, beautiful. Mm -hmm. Oh, I thought you were about to start talking, Catherine. You did when you did this. I was like, "Oh, is that the?" Uh, I'm I, about to go. I, I, I could, but Jake did that beautifully. Do you want to move on to another question, or well, I guess one of the one of the follow ups that um, is it, you know, so often the battle for inclusion in religious spaces is waged with the background binary as normative, right? Mm -hmm. And so even in more progressive Christian denominations, the battle for inclusion in is let's recognize this element of difference as valid as, right, the normative binary husband and wife, like, like structure. And I don't think that... Um, the structure of the family is the only part the tradition has essentialized the binary 
and then thought if we're going to progress in scare quotes for those only listening or if we're going to grow or whatever it's taking more particulars that were previously excluded from something good and insert them in the positive column right like uh, uh it, you know we start adding letters to our list of inclusions and we feel like we get more points but underneath uh, both of your work is the way in which the same violence that gets itself done by assuming one kind of pairing is normative is the same kind of violence that gets itself done to the globe, right? Through a lot of our assuming as natural an economic machine and exploitation. And there's lots of these patterns too. Um, thinking, think of how bad I mean, granted, we're processed, so maybe this is assumed, but like how bad discussions about uh, divine power are shaped by um, a like hyper patriarchal asshole deity or like when we think of atonement like debates or like even election. They're like, are you Arminian or a Calvinist? You're like, ah, I'm just going to go ahead and say whatever scale this is on. It's not good. Right. And so like one of the things I have found so life-giving listening to people who have queer identities and are part of my congregation or part of the academy and I've listened to or theorists I've read and then learned from that are dead is that there's so much more life to be benefited and make possible and our task should not be as leaders of institutions, the academy, churches, to just make space for someone else to show up where the terms are set by the inherited structures, but to bring the, all that difference and then we re-envision ourselves, right? Like you adopt someone in your family, your family doesn't tell you this is how you join us, you become new. Or the many and the one are increased by one. There's a kind of creative way of queering that's different than inclusion at, but that preserves the infrastructure of oppressive binaries does that make sense like i feel like there's so much to gain by queering things that uh if you don't recognize what's being problematized you feel like you've won just by having a few new friends no, it, I, I think there, there, there is a, a kind of mysterious liberative force that the word queer <laughs> has been unleashing now for, for decades. Uh, and it keeps coming into its own in new ways. And you're right, it has, it has a lot to do with, with, with the creativity of the, the, process, the process cosmos and a, a God luring us not to you know, perfect some already established binary form, but luring towards greater complexity, right? And greater intensity. Those are the two hyper values in process reality. It's complexity and intensity. And queerness requires both. Uh, and it doesn't require you to, to cease being, you know, like, <laughs> A man married to a woman in a fairly recognizably conventional form. <coughs> it doesn't require you to give up that, <coughs> that identity. It does require you to live your relationship to each other, even within your heterosexuality and within its possibly very, very straight kind of marriage commitment, but to live that relationship uh, with freshness, with a, a kind of complexity and novelty that's going to open you to new registers of yourself, uh, of your own so-called femininity, your own so-called masculinity, um, and is, is going to open into queerness uh, that, that is experienced sensually. Uh, that doesn't mean that, uh, that you're going to start have to, ha having to practice other modes of sex that that isn't that, that, that that's just way too simplistic and literal uh but so whatever modes of, of sex one is practicing in whatever mode of relationship there there's something about the the process god that's always 
always trying to queer the cosmos <laughs> and queer the cosmos right where you are in, 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 in intercarnate <laughs> with everyone else in it because because you're not being invited to replicate some structure or mimic it in, you know, even in some, some really hip LGBTQ way. I mean, the Q is crucial uh, that there's gotta be an indeterminacy, an uncertainty that allows that playful creativity to happen. And therefore that, that honors God's call of us to greater complexity uh, and therefore greater intensity also for God. And clearly uh, what queerness is about has been a rich intensification and complexification of, of all that we mean by, by sex and gender. Uh, and, you know, I'm celebrating my 25th marriage anniversary to Jason. I'm, I'm pretty boring in that way. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and I just feel like I'd have a, a much a, a much flatter, emptier life and relationship to process theology, were it not were it not for the waves of of input uh, that 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 come from from queer theology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of my friends who's on my mind right now, Carol Wayne White, hasn't written much explicitly on how she connects her queerness to her African-American identity and to her deep involvement in, in process thought. But I really recommend Black Lives and Sacred Humanity mm -hmm. um, because it, it, it gets at a sense of, of sacrality mm -hmm. that's just always, always multiple layered uh, and, and surprising, playful even as it calls us into you know, rigorous responsibility around, for instance, uh, my whiteness, uh, my straightness, and the ways in which those give me undue privilege. Uh, so yeah, I, I, think it's, I think it's an era though, an interface that between um, process theology and queer theology that, that could use a lot more explicit unfolding than it's, than it's gotten so far. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So uh, I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask one more question so we don't end up going over time wise, which Jake knows last time that happened um, very significantly. Um, but, uh, but this is one of our fun questions. And I, it, so I have to admit, Twitter sometimes sends a whole host of questions or maybe I'll let y'all pick whichever one of the fun questions you want to answer that way. Uh, so I'll read them all. So everyone gets credit for sending questions that are not long theological questions that then I have to figure out if they make sense in a conversation. Uh, fun questions. People send in most underrated theologian and their zesty idea, the most overrated theologian and the idea you would like to mute. That's funny. Um, a text that changed your mind, favorite text to teach in the classroom, what complaint about process thought are you tired of hearing, what is the most compelling personally, if you could have one song play every time you entered a room, what would it be and why? I, that, that, it's just real hard if you grew up watching WWF in the 80s, not to think of your ring entrance song, so I... Uh, <laughs> But I wouldn't want everyone to think I'm coming into a fight. And the last one is, what's a saying or expression that academics probably say too much? <laughs> All, so you can pick any of them um, to answer. Do you, have a, do you have a particular one you'd like to answer? <laughs> Otherwise, we would talk all night. I just think they're all fun. They, they are all fun. Um, <sighs> You know, I, I feel I, I want to do the most funny duddy thing possible and say, yeah, the under the underranked theologian, <laughs> very way underestimated. <laughs> Nicholas of Cusa, <laughs> Catholic cardinal from the 15th century. Anyway, I, I wrote all about him in my Cloud of the Impossible. And that's that's his phrase, Cloud of the Impossible. Because he thinks that's, that's, that's what we have to confront and it's painful to enter into the cloud of the impossible because it means, it means we're facing into contradictions 
for him, his whole Orthodox faith was conflicting with, with his theological intuitions, like his, his sense of God as the creator, uh, which he's, he knows well from his tradition and as, as in control, dominating and, and doing uh, the, the creating, the moving was in contradiction with, with his understanding of God as also creatable, <laughs> as being moved, not merely mover. So I could go on and on about him, but I already did that in a book, but I, I just wanted to bring into play that, that, that image of, of the cloud of the impossible, his image, uh, because uh, it, it, it's, it's a dark space that we enter when we find you know, that parts of ourselves or our lives or our faith or our faith and our experience are in contradiction, in conflict, our relationships. Mm -hmm. and, and it turns out there's an intense luminosity in that, in that very cloud, that it's where one does in, encounter the divine in facing those contradictions. That's what he called the coincidence of offices, the coincidencia, <laughs> mm -hmm. oppositorum. Uh, so that you was the, what's, the answer. So when, when the first time you were on the podcast, Catherine, uh, mm -hmm. 10 or 11 years ago, at the end of it, I said, well, what's something you you've gotten interested in recently and you were like nicholas of cusa uh, and i was like yeah and i said are you like why are you into it and you said i, I don't know i know because i because i you, before you said well i know that you introduced me as a competitor for president of the john cobb fan club with you and i feel like i just have the ability to stay president until i let you be in charge you like you were playing about that but I'd only let John Cobb go if I got to be Kusa's president. And then <laughs> you gave a pitch to be uh, uh, for why everyone should read Nicholas of Kusa. So if it, people are interested in like, I mean, fiery prophetic sermon, bring people to the altar of, you know, the coincidence of opposites. Uh, if you go to the barrel age podcast, the first oldest Catherine Keller episode is uh, it, is pretty fun. And, that's, um, a funny co that's a funny coinciding of, of times. <laughs> I guess that was about what I was getting going on that. On yeah. That yeah. But I would always recommend that, that folk read John Cobb first, but he's much <laughs> less underestimated than his Nicholas of Cusa. <laughs> Fortunately, I'm really glad that, that Cobb uh, is, is probably recognized by a critical mass of theologians around the world as the most important living North American theologian, for instance. Yes. <laughs> All right, Jake. Which which of our which of the uh, plethora of fun questions did you? Uh... It's, it is it talk about a, like talk about a little bit of a queer carnival. Like I've got all the different questions in my mind swirling around that. Um, I mean, like I could say Eryugena and then go off on a whole um, theophanic riff. Um, most overrated theologian um, men, <laughs> just in general. <laughs> like you mean the you old know. Adam. If I could, if I could set aside anyone named Carl Thomas Aquinas, and or at least sort of Neo Thomas moment, <laughs> like, then I'd be like, I'd just be be super super happy. Um, uh, uh, but yeah, no, I, I, th I th no, I think I think I think I'd say. Um, I think I'd say the Eugenia piece, but I will say I, I will. I, I've said it. On, I said it to you before. The the one the one piece that has the one piece of theology that changed my life was um, Tillich's "You Are Accepted," in that small sermon. Um, that that got me, um, and for a whole bunch of reasons. And I will uh, I will never let it go. Um, mm -hmm. Just for the last lines of it, so. Oh, it's a beautiful sermon. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Catherine, hold up the book again so everyone can see it. And oh, look at that, Jacob also had <laughs> this is beautiful student moment. <laughs> He's prepared. Yeah, He's prepared. Student. Indeed. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> this has been a ton of fun. I've really enjoyed it, and uh, I, yeah, I, I just hope that. When this is over, 
Jake and Catherine decide to talk to each other more on the internet because it's very <laughs> pleasant and it makes my job really, really easy um, versus some other things that involve it a lot more editing afterward. So, but will you send me those those chats somehow? I don't know how to capture them, and I see they're ninety nine. <laughs> yes, bits of chat yeah. corner, which I think is the max I've ever seen in a chat box. But will you, can I have those just so I well the the uh, yeah I will I will send them to you. the The process party of online people are very uh, very excited. I mean, you're kind of you know there's a certain niche where you're basically Beyonce, Catherine. <laughs> I won't admit how flattered I am. Okay, don't. <laughs> the Lord. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but glad to come back, I will say. Okay. Good. <laughs> good. Then then if uh, if your fun question didn't get answered, next time we will start with fun questions and um that way we can find out what Jake and Catherine's entrance song is should they <laughs> join the Theological Wrestling Federation. Um It'd be fun. But thank you all for hanging out and thank you both for joining. And I hope you all uh, have an excellent evening wherever uh, wherever you are. Thank you, Trev. <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> oh, there you are. What great.